to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 160, and it's all about Elizabeth and China in the spirit of strong women rulers. As I'm recording, it's January the 15th, and Elizabeth's coronation day, or if you have a small daughter or are close to any little girls, you can also hear Anna saying, it's coronation day in your head when I say that, right? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up. But this episode is going to be a little different. I'm going to be playing Connect the Dots with a few very famous Elizabethan motifs and objects, and it's going to lead us to China. And I will say that all of this that I'm going to be talking about comes from a relatively recent book called Elizabethan Globalism, England, China, and the Rainbow Portrait by Matthew Dimmock. I discovered these connections while wanting to do an episode on Elizabeth's foreign policy beyond Europe. So I've got links to the book and to all the different book reviews and sources, everything like that on the website at englandcast.com slash China, englandcast.com slash China. But before I get started, I also just want to put in a quick note about TudorCon. So you guys, TudorCon tickets went a little bit crazy a couple of weeks ago. And a whole bunch of people bought their tickets all at once. So I literally have 13 tickets left for TudorCon 2021 in October. It's possible I might be able to get another 10 opened up. Um, it depends on the, the fire marshal and it, it's all about, you know, the capacity of the venue. Um, so there might be another 10, but I'm not sure I can't guarantee that. And as of right now, there's just 13 tickets left. So if you want to come to TudorCon... <laughs> kind of now's the time to get your ticket. And I do have a payment plan option available if you need a little bit of time to pay it off in installments. I know this is a crazy time for everybody and I want to make it as easy as possible for people to be able to come. So you can just email me and we can work out a payment plan. I have people doing things in six installments generally is what what it looks like. So you can go to englandcast.com slash tutorcon2021 for all of the details and to see a video of last year, well, I guess 2019, and to learn more about what it's all about. So englandcast.com slash TudorCon 2021, three days of Tudor excitement and madness, talks, lectures, fun parties, new best friends, all in beautiful Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, October 1st through 3rd. 13 tickets left. So on Monday, December 6th, 1602, Robert Cecil threw a housewarming party for a new home on the Strand. In his survey of London, John Stowe wrote, Sir Robert Cecil, Principal Secretary to Her Majesty, hath lately raised a large and stately house of brick and timber, has also leveled and paved the highway near adjoining to the great beautifying of that street and commodity of passengers. The party was actually postponed three times, waiting for the Queen's schedule to open up. The notation in the diary said, The Queen dined this day at Mr. Secretary's, where they say there is great variety of entertainment prepared for her and many rich jewels and presents. So we're going to talk about one of those presents, but first we're going to talk about the entertainment. One of the entertainments was a play by the playwright John Davies. It included this prose dialogue between a gentleman usher and a post, which would be another word for a courier. A post bringing letters from the emperor of China to the secretary is urged by the usher to deliver them directly to the queen who speaks and understands all the languages in the world, which are worthy to be spoken or understood. Sawest thou ever more majesty or more perfection met together in one body? Besides all her perfections, all the earth hath not such a prince for affability. For all is one, come gentleman, come serving man, come plowman, come beggar. The hour is yet to come that ever she refused petition. Draw near her, kneel down before her, kiss thy letters and deliver them, and use no prattling while she is reading. 
And if ever thou have worse words than God have mercy, fellow, and give him a reward, never trust me while thou livest. John Davies was a relatively minor playwright for hire, and so he was hired to create some entertainment for this event. So you'll note that in the play, there were letters coming from China. Elizabeth had been trying to build up a relationship with the Chinese emperor Wan Li for about 10 years by this point, with no success. In the 1580s, she had received gifts of porcelain from China, courtesy of Portuguese traders, and she was very interested in being able to offer that directly in England and having a direct relationship with China. Her first foray into this relationship was a ship that left in 1596 with a letter, the emperor, but nothing had been heard of its captain ever since. They were still holding out hope that he might have made it and was on his way back with letters, though, by this point. And so the audience that night in 1602 at Robert Cecil's housewarming party, it would have been made up of these lords and ladies and people who saw the performance would have been tuned in to all of the importance and the messages behind it. So just that previous summer, we're talking about December at this point when he had his party. But over the summer, George Weymouth, he was a navigator from Devon. He had gone to the East India Company and proposed a voyage in search of the Northwest Passage to Asia. So this wasn't that uncommon. It was a a common desire to find a Northwest Passage at this point. But people had been trying it already with no success. And so the company was kind of taking a chance in accepting Weymouth's proposal. This wasn't the first time somebody had tried to find the Northwest Passage, but it agreed to fund the voyage as long as he and his crew spent at least one year from the time of their departure in going forward, seeking, sounding, and attempting the performance of the intended voyage. So they would give him money as long as he spent a year at least doing it. They didn't want him just going out and then saying, okay, well, we can't do it, and then coming back. So Weymouth agreed, and on May the 2nd, 1602, he left London with the ship Discovery, which was 70 tons, and also the Godspeed, which was 60 tons. And with him on that ship was a beautiful letter, a exquisitely ornamented, they say, letter from Elizabeth to, again, the Emperor of China. And the idea was that Weymouth would be able to give this letter to the Emperor of China when he reached China. He was pretty successful early on. He made good progress along the eastern coast of Baffin Island until July 19th, in the night between the 19th and 20th, his men mutinied in protest. There had been a really heavy frost in the Davis Strait, and they mutinied about this. So then both ships soon after were hit by a ferocious storm, and Weymouth and his crew had to return home. Of course, returning home meant that they were going to have to face the inquiries of the Privy Council of the East India Company because they were breaking their agreement to spend at least a year from the day they left. So what was the desire to go west to wind up in the east for this? By this point, the Portuguese had established a trading port, Macau, which was in the south of China. The Dutch were also having success in Indonesia and the Philippines. And that basically would have blocked the passage of any English ships. They had the obvious routes already all sewn up. The route that they would have gone would have been via India and the Malacca Strait between the Malay Peninsula and Sumatra. So it seems that Elizabeth wanted to get around the Portuguese and the Dutch by coming at it from a completely unexpected and different direction without actually having to tangle with either nation. Weymouth returned to England in August, August 5th, 1602. So he had only spent three months at sea instead of the agreed upon year. And it's possible that Davies wrote this dialogue before the news of his return. But the fact that the performance even went on showed this kind of optimism of Elizabeth's subjects that a letter from the emperor of China might yet arrive. Also, the fact that Elizabeth was receiving the letter and not Elizabeth giving the letter kind of gave this sense of showing her majesty and her power. Again, like I said, this letter that Weymouth carried with him and brought back undelivered 
was the third time that Elizabeth had addressed the Emperor of China. The very first letter had been sent out in 1583, followed then by the other letter I talked about in 1596. Each of the letters was carried by a different crew of English ships, and they wanted to tap into this trade directly of silks and spices and porcelain, and none of them had success. Now, interestingly enough, at the same time, Richard Hakalite, who I did an episode on, gosh, maybe two years ago, England's first travel writer, he published translations of the first two letters in his principal navigations, the voyages, traffics, and discoveries of the English nation. And he wrote principal navigations in part to encourage the furthering of English exploration and funding more ships and more voyages of exploration. So you can listen to that show on Richard Hakalite if you want to get more information about him. He was this amazing travel writer who wrote all about the New World, all about the Americas, and he had never actually been there. So he's a fascinating character. The third letter, the 1602 one, actually is still in the Lancashire Records office in the UK. So this dialogue from the John Davies play performed at Cecil's housewarming, it shows that Elizabeth's attempt to reach this kind of diplomatic relationship with Cathay, with China, was widely known and was encouraged and even celebrated by her subjects at court. The letters never reached the emperor of China, and they certainly didn't secure any of the trading privileges or relationship that she wanted, at least during her lifetime. But they symbolize this expansion of England's cultural and commercial and geopolitical horizons. Of course, up until that point, England had still been very insular. Henry VII had funded the Cabot uh, explorations, but Henry VIII, for all his love of ships, he really didn't fund that much in terms of exploration and trading sorts of relationships. But Elizabeth was, and people were celebrating that by this point. And so they celebrated the fact that she even had sent ships to China with this letter. By 1613, so after 10 years after Elizabeth had died, the East India Company did start to establish a trading post in Harado, Japan. And again, they wanted to still break into the Portuguese trade with Chinese silks. That trading post would close just within 10 years because it wasn't making any money. And the first direct contact between England and China wasn't made until 1637 when a Captain John Weddell arrived at Canton to negotiate a relationship with the Chinese merchants. But sadly, he and his two ships, which by this point were filled with exotic Chinese goods, had disappeared in really mysterious circumstances on the trip back to England. It wasn't until 1792 1792, that England and China finally started to build a successful trading relationship. But again, this audience, the lords and ladies who would have been in the Davies audience, they knew that their queen was trying to widen her diplomatic network And nobody had done as much to widen the diplomatic network during their lifetime as Elizabeth had done. And so they really wanted to celebrate that. I'm going to read you the letter that she wrote to the Emperor Wanli. It says, Elizabeth, by the grace of God, Queen of England, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, to the great and mighty and invincible Emperor of Cathay, greetings. We have received divers and sundry reports both by our own subjects and others who have visited some parts of your majesty's empire. They have told us of your greatness and your kind usage of strangers who come to your kingdom with merchandise to trade. This has encouraged us to find a shorter route by sea from us to your country than the usual course that involves encompassing the greatest part of the world. This nearer passage may provide opportunity for trade between the subjects of both our countries, and also amity may grow between us due to the navigation of a closer route. With this in mind, we have many times in the past encouraged some of our pioneering subjects to find this nearer passage through the north. Some of their ships didn't return again, and nothing was ever heard of them, presumably because of frozen seas and intolerable cold. However, we wish to try again and have prepared and set forth two small ships under the direction of our subject, George Weymouth, employed as principal pilot for his knowledge and experience in navigation. 
We hope your majesty will look kindly on them and give them encouragement to make this new discovered passage, which hitherto has not been frequented or known as a usual trade route. By this means, our countries can exchange commodities for our mutual benefit, and as a result, friendship may grow. We decided for this first passage not to burden your majesty with great quantities of commodities as the ships were venturing on a previously unknown route and would need such necessities as required for their discovery. It may please your majesty to observe on the ships samples available from our country of many diverse materials which we can supply most amply. And may it please your majesty to inquire of the said George Weymouth what may be supplied by the next fleet. In the meantime, we commend your majesty to the protection of the eternal God, who providence guides and follows all kings and kingdoms, from our royal palace of Greenwich, the 4th of May, Anno Domini 1602, and of our reign, 44, Elizabeth R. So that kind of shows the way these letters were structured and the way Elizabeth saw this potential relationship. The letter was finally delivered in China in 1984 which is a delay that makes the current mail delays we're experiencing look like absolutely nothing, right? So also, the other part of this is that in his book on Elizabethan globalism, Professor Demick makes the case that the famous rainbow portrait of Elizabeth, again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll have a picture of it at the show notes at englandcast.com slash China. So supposedly, his theory is that that rainbow portrait was commissioned as part of the Cecil housewarming party, and that in the Davies play, this gift of a cloak presented to Elizabeth is actually the cloak that she's wearing in the painting, and that the motifs on the rainbow painting, which are like a lot of eyes and ears, that that in the past people thought alluded to her spy network under Walsingham, the kind of new theory that Professor Dimmock puts forward is that it alluded to the fact that she was trying to be famous so that everybody could see England and could see Elizabeth all over the whole world. We also know that Cecil had a very large collection of porcelain from China, which would have been on display in all its glory at that housewarming party. More evidence that England wanted to have ties to China and have a strong trading relationship. At least one of those pieces is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. It was a gift from J.P. Morgan back in the day. Again, I'll have pictures of all of this stuff at englandcast.com slash China. By the time of the party, Elizabethans had some good ideas about China, where it was, what you could buy there, etc. They had the accounts of Marco Polo, which were available in English in 1579. The translation by John Frampton was The Most Noble and Famous Travels of Marco Polo. And then there were English merchants like Ralph Fitch, who traveled to Malacca. It was easily in China's trading zone at the time, and he returned to England in 1591. Fitch's journey actually is referenced indirectly by Shakespeare in Macbeth, Act 1, Scene 3, where the first witch cackles something about the wife of a sailor her husband's to Aleppo gone, master of the Tiger. Fitch became one of the most celebrated Elizabethan adventurers, and his experience was really valued by the founders of the East India Company. They would consult with him about affairs in India. So there we have it. We have a housewarming party at Cecil's with a play by Davies, a potential cloak in the rainbow portrait, and Chinese porcelain all of which is connected to the idea that England at this point was really trying to build a relationship with China and was trying to expand her horizons and become more globalistic, I suppose. And I wanted to kind of continue on that theme that we talked about with Iceland last week as well. A lot of times when we talk about Tudor history, it's easy to just get in this um, kind of mode of talking about England and maybe France and Spain and this kind of triangle of these countries. But there really were relationships with way more countries out there. And over the next couple of months, maybe over the next year, I would like to explore some of those relationships that England had with these other countries and show that there was a much wider world out there than maybe we might have expected. So that is it for this week. The book recommendation is that Matthew Dimmick. It's called Elizabethan Globalism, England, China, and the Rainbow Portrait. 
And I will have a link again, englandcast.com slash China. Let me know what you thought about the episode. You can always get in touch with me through the listener support line at 8016 Tesco, or you can join the new Tudor Learning Circle, which is a free social network just for Tudor history nerds, tutorlearningcircle.com. Thank you so much for listening. And oh, remember TudorCon tickets too, if you're interested in that, englandcast.com slash TudorCon. All right. Thanks so much for listening. And I will talk with you again soon. Bye-bye. Blow, northern wind, a scent for baby sweating. Blow, northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoot a board in Bauerbrick, that soul is Sam Lee's on sicht. Men's cool maiden of me, fair and fray to fond. In all this war, flesh of one, born of blood and of bond, never yet in Houston, not so merry in London, blow.